Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to our new season of Marketing Club events. Tonight we'll be kicking off the series with the latest trends in digital marketing with Dana Rolls. The Marketing Club was created primarily to help students get the most from their CIM accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. This webinar is one of six online events we'll be running this academic year for our Marketing Club series with further webinars in November, January, February, March, and April. Of course, CI members and other marketing practitioners are welcome to attend as well as students. For the uninitiated, the CIM accredited degree program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions the accredited degree provides. And if you're a student, you can sign up now to receive regular marketing club updates. Simply take a photo of the QR code you see on screen. We'll also send you a link to the sign up page after today's session. Each edition will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations, and concepts in the marketing industry. So I'd now like to hand over to Daniel Rouse, Program Director for Imperial College Business School and CEO of Target Internet, who is our guest speaker this evening. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. Uh, great to see you, everyone. Let me just uh, go through and uh, explain who I am a little bit, and then I'll tell you what we're going to go through uh, in this session together. So, um, I'm Daniel Rolls, CEO of Target Internet. I'll talk about Target Internet in a moment, but we work with lots of the world's leading brands upskilling their teams around digital marketing. Uh, I'm founder of the Digital Leadership Programme, which is uh, an alternative to the university route uh, into digital marketing. Uh, and if you want to say anything during the presentation, Phil's just giving you the CIM details. Uh, I am at Daniel Rolls on Twitter, and if it's on Instagram, it's Target Internet, but that is me. Uh, Target Internet works with all of the brands that you can see here, um, helping upskill their teams, from helping the McKinsey Consultant, the, the team at Google, and lots of other brands that you'll know uh, very well indeed. I'm also Program Director at Imperial College, where I head up digital marketing and digital transformation. Uh, and um, I, the host of the Digital Marketing Podcast, which is a global uh, top 100 business podcast. And the reason I showed this particular slide, you'll see us there next to Reid Hoffman, who started LinkedIn and PayPal. We're next to the Financial Times, BBC Radio 4. This costs nothing to produce. Um, so I'll touch on that a little bit later on as well. But the point of this is that it's not about big budgets. It's just about understanding our audiences and actually going back to the fundamentals of marketing. And I'm going to talk about this a bit today. But the whole thing of getting the right content in front of the right person at the right time in the right channel, that's what marketing's about. And this podcast just ticks those boxes. There's no, if you listen to it, there's nothing particularly clever about it. It's just me and my friend Kieran chatting for half an hour, but it gets um, a lot of listeners as well. And I've written a few books on the topic, um, which I promise not to mention at all after this. The whole aim of this is to persuade you that I know what I'm talking about. So let's start where I like to start. And if you want our other presentations, don't panic. It's not the same presentation. I just wanted to highlight this. This is from Internet Live Stats, and this shows you what's happened so far online today in terms of content creation. Um, we are up to uh, over 4 million blog posts uh, already today. You see, according to this, there have been more videos viewed on YouTube than searches done in Google, uh, 195 billion emails today, so on and so forth. Put this in perspective. At the beginning of lockdown, about 50 years of content were uploaded to YouTube every day. By the end of lockdown, that number was up to 65 years of content every day. The latest figure I've seen, which is not verified yet, says it's getting up towards 78 years of content every day. If you think about the likelihood of anyone actually watching your video, it is in getting increasingly small. So coming back to marketing fundamentals, right content, right place, right time, we just need to make sure that we're really ticking those boxes and we understand our target audience. So I wanna talk about a load of latest trends today, but I want you to have at the back of your mind the whole time, actually, let's not get distracted by a lot of this stuff. Let's really focus in on what does this mean in terms of getting that right content in front of the right person at the right time. So yes, huge volumes of content. That means our job is harder, but actually, hopefully that sets the bar for us. And it says, if we're going to do this, we need to do it right. We can't just be sitting here blasting out content. Now, I'll come to something at the end of this presentation. We've just updated 
the digital skills benchmark, which looks at where are the industry skills. And what we've seen is yeah, a slight uplift in content marketing skills. You might think that means great, more good quality content. It doesn't. It just means more content because more people have got to the basic level of understanding. So actually, unfortunately, it means more average content, which is what this noise is, is kind of the problem that we're suffering. So we've got this at the back of our mind. Right, key trends, key things that are happening. Um, you may or may not have noticed this, you may not have seen it rolled out to your account yet. We're seeing what we're kind of referring to as platform unification, particularly across the Facebook real estate. So across Facebook, uh, Messenger, Instagram, uh, and WhatsApp, the platforms are starting to merge. And you'll see this in a number of different areas, but what you're seeing now is within Facebook, you'll be scrolling through and you will have Instagram reels that is those one minute up to one minute videos now recommended to you in Facebook. What does that mean? It means anything that you're creating within Reels is now reaching a much broader audience because it's reaching that Facebook audience. Now we talk about the shift away from Facebook and everyone's using Instagram and TikTok and so on as well. Realistically, an awful lot of people are still using Facebook very actively. Um, young people as well, um, to some extent. But definitely, if you look at the kind of 35, 45 plus audience, they are still very active, Facebook users in many cases. And that is the audience, the highest disposable income. So from a marketing audience, that can be quite an interesting one as well. Um, latest numbers, average TikTok user is now spending 52 minutes a day uh, on the platform. Does that mean you should be um, on TikTok? Not necessarily. We'll maybe talk about that a little bit later on as well. It really depends on your brand as well. But the, this platform unification from Facebook, keep an eye out for this. The idea that you'll be able to send something from Messenger through to WhatsApp, if that's the person's preferred platform. And if you prefer Instagram Messenger, it will, set, will end up there for you. So this cross, cross kind of communication across these different platforms. What that also means is that Facebook is unifying some of its advertising options so that you're gonna see a lot more advertising options within messaging apps within WhatsApp, within uh, Messenger and within Instagram Messenger as well. So we're starting to see uh, a lot of this starting to happen. So keep an eye out on, on this kind of stuff as well. Big changes in the world of email. Now you might look at email and go, well, wow, that's not really where it's at in terms of marketing and digital marketing. I'm going to try and change your mind about that tonight because we've seen some huge shifts in this space. But Apple, as you probably already know, have been really focusing on privacy lately. And you had that whole thing now when you go to use an app and it pops up and says, this app wants to track you across this app and other apps. And it's kind of the word in the way to say, no thanks, I don't really want that. That's about your information being tracked. We'll talk about cookies and things like that in a moment. But actually they said, well actually in email, there's a level of tracking going on that people probably aren't aware of. And actually we're gonna, we're gonna stop that. So at the moment, may or may not be aware, when you open an email, how your email service provider knows that you've opened that email is that there's a little hidden one pixel image in your email. And when you would even notice it, it's the same background color as the email itself. And that will load when you open the email. So we now then know that you've opened the email. Two problems with that. One is that maybe you open that email for one second and then you go, this isn't for me and you delete it. That will still show as an open. Or how about if you've got a um, image blocker, so your email client isn't loading images, even though someone's opened it until they load the images, you won't know. Anyway, it's not, not the most accurate measure, but it was a measure we've relied on and we tend to benchmark. I've got this open rate for this email, this open rate for this one, this one was better. That would tell us if our subject line was good. It would tell us, uh, did we send it at the right time? But what's now actually happening is they're saying, or Apple are saying, if you've got iOS 14, we're gonna stop that from loading. So it's gonna hide your IP address, which in turn will hide your location. It will hide if you've opened an email or not. Now you might think what that's gonna mean is that your open rates are gonna dip because everybody that's using um, Apple Mail on any iOS device, you're not gonna see that open. Actually, it's gonna do the opposite. What they're gonna do is they're gonna cache it, they're gonna load it for everyone and they're gonna show it to them, but they won't load it, load it for that individual. What does that mean? It basically means your open rates will go up so if suddenly you're in the next month or two, you're running campaigns and your open rates jump up and you go, yeah, brilliant, that's fantastic. No, it's not. What it probably means is that this Apple change is having an impact. All you've really got to do is set a new benchmark. 
But if a large percentage of people on your list are on an Apple Mail device, it means the open rate is not really telling you anything useful because it's going to give you a false positive from that point of view. What does that mean? It means you need to focus on click through rate. And actually, it's a much better measure anyway. Next problem with this email update is that when you're in Safari, they are going to allow you, when you're filling a form in, to give a temporary email address. Do you know when you go through and it says, get a 10% discount or download this white paper now, just give us your email address. You'll be able to give them a temporary email address and at any point you can just delete that email. So what that means from a marketing perspective is one, I can't trust my open rates, so I need to focus on click-through rates. I need to set new benchmarks for my open rates. But also, it means that I really need to focus on click-through rate, but ongoing click. Give me your email address and I will keep providing you great free stuff. Not just a white paper now, but a white paper every month. And it should be about building relationships. Now, really, if you go and look at direct mail, like posts we would get through our doors, the same kind of thing happened. We were getting bombarded with so much of it that we had to put the brakes on it and we had to say, right, it's got to be about quality. We need some rules and regulations. So I actually think this is probably a good thing. It's going to slow down uh, what we were referring to bacon. So spam was the stuff you just didn't want. You didn't ask for it in the first place. Bacon was all that stuff that you asked for, but you never read. Well, actually, maybe we start to think about this a little bit more carefully. So look out for this. You're going to see a shift uh, in your open rates over time. That brings us on to this whole third party cookie things, which is confusing a lot of people. So I just wanted to kind of clarify and give you some resources. As has been said, my slides, are you can download them from within the handouts on the platform now. So all these links uh, are in there. At the end of the session, I'm going to give you um, some takeaways that you can download. So I'm going to try and keep you at the end of the session uh, so you can download those, but you can get my slides uh, in here. So. Third party cookies, what is this all about and what's going to shift things? Basically, all the major browsers are going to gradually disallow third party cookies. Safari is already doing it to some extent. Um, Chrome are kind of building up to it. What it really means is a lot of the advertising that you're seeing out there at the moment, their targeting is going to start to be a little bit limited. So at the moment, if I go, I've got a screenshot here from the Daily Mail website. I go through to that website and all the different ad networks on there that show me ads have been able to track me across multiple websites. They built a profile about me and then they can use that profile to target ads at me. The reality is that a lot of us don't want that and other browsers are going to stop blocking it. So first party cookies, if you've been to my website, I can build a profile of you and I can target things at you um, and I can potentially target at you on other websites that will still continue. But the reliance on going to platforms like Facebook's audience network or the Google display network and using all that accumulated data they've got to say, I want people in this location of this age are interested in this. A lot of that data isn't going to be available. What's the solution? First of all, first party cookies are, are much better anyway. If I've got you to my website, then I can target at you differently. I can still do um, the kind of targeting that's based on content. If you're on a digital marketing website, I can assume you've got an interest in digital marketing. But Google is really pushing forward in terms of artificial intelligence. So not actually collecting data about an individual, but using AI to try and target some of these things as well. It gets hugely complicated and really technical. So I've put a link on the screen there that you can read afterwards that will really give you the lowdown uh, on all the technicalities. You can absorb that uh, at your own pace. Uh, but essentially, we're going to start seeing some different advertising options and I'll get to the, the whole AI targeting thing um, in just a moment as well. Right. So now we're going to talk about email and I'm going to try and persuade you how important email is again. The newsletter on your screen here does not look particularly exciting in terms of design. But the context behind it is what's really important. So we did a test with this and we said we've got our podcast audience. Uh, we've had over three million listeners to the podcast. But the problem with the podcast is broadcast. Unless you draw someone back to your website, your app or something else, you don't know who those people are. So we said, well, what's really important? What's important is community. We want people that really want to engage. How are we going to do that? What's the best way of owning it? Well, look, we could do something. We could do a Facebook group. But the problem is Facebook groups engagement has been going down and we don't own it. And we could do LinkedIn groups, but they're no good anymore because they're absolutely bombarded uh, with spam. And I could do a clubhouse or I could do, but it, none of it felt quite right. And the problem with all of those things is that you don't own it. The social network own it. And that means they have control over it. But also, if people shift away from that platform, you lose your audience. Email, however, 
I can get you to opt in for something and actually engage with it and give you a two-way communication via email, that could be pretty powerful. So what we said was, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, every week or two or three, depending on when, when we've got something good to send you, we'll send you three tools, tips, or techniques. There will be no ads and no sales. And the format is, there's an intro paragraph, this is what we've been up to. Three tools, tips, or techniques that you can take away and use and just download straight away. Not all our stuff, you know, loads of third party stuff we found useful. And at the bottom, we ask a question of the audience. The email comes directly from my inbox. And any replies come directly to my inbox. Now they're put into a subfolder for me so I can deal with it from a management point of view. What amazes me about this is um, average open rates are about 22 to 25 percent average click through rates are about three percent um, we're getting 70 percent open rate and we're getting 30 to 50 percent click through rate so it's off the charts in terms of that but actually at that bottom you see the bottom paragraph where i go in and say here's a little question like what are you reading at the moment what, what are the best digital marketing books so i don't really know, you know what to read at the moment about 10 percent of the audience reply to it directly now that's a lot of workload to deal with but actually that's a one-to-one -one relationship with my audience. So this is really important, this builds community. There's nothing clever about it other than it fits into the user journey. Because the user journey is these are marketers, these are students that need to stay up to date with things, therefore they want this. So think about how you can use email effectively and always think about this whole thing of marketing, what can I do for my audience, not what can I do to my audience? And if you get that, then you suddenly become a trusted partner, then you can build community then you can drive engagement then when you want them to do something it's not such a big ask to go well actually we've got this service why don't you subscribe and you'd get more of this kind of stuff as well so getting back to those fundamentals but think about if you look at your engagement rates for social media they're going to be low if you look at your engagement rates for email good email they're way higher so actually we need to take a step back and say if i'm really truthfully looking at my analytics and saying how much is social media contributing to my end outcomes and if i did a, if i put that much effort into my email would it do as well or would it do better i'm not saying it will i'm saying you need to question it because that's our job as marketers is to test and learn and test and learn the whole time but don't assume that some of these old channels are now dead because you know we're all bombarded with email we're bombarded with emails that aren't relevant whereas actually if we can do the right thing it can work still right lots of changes going on with Google Analytics as well. So I mentioned this last time, but I wanted to give an update on this. Uh, the standard version of Google Analytics is universal analytics, and that's what about 92, 93% of us are, are still using. The new version of Google Analytics, GA4, has come out. Now, eventually, everyone will have to move to GA4. You can have universal analytics and GA4 running on the website at the same time. So there's no reason you not to do that. The overhead in terms of slowing your website down, we've done lots of testing on this, is, is pretty much minimal. So it's not really causing too many problems um, from that viewpoint. The problem is you've got loads of reports in universal analytics that don't exist in GA4, but Google are really putting a lot of effort into GA4, and there are all sorts of interesting things now coming out. Now, when we talked about this last time, the disparity between what universal analytics was giving you in terms of data and what data we were getting from GA4, there was in some cases a 30% difference, which is just, you know, it's no good at all. I don't know what I can trust. We've seen a lot of that slowing down and we're now seeing at most five, 10% difference in the figures. So we're, what we're advising our clients at the moment is have both running now and then January of next year is when you can start really thinking about checking, going, okay, I'm pretty trustworthy of the data now. I'm gonna move across. What that means is you need to start upskilling yourself uh, in GA4. The great thing um, about this is actually, even if you haven't got Universal Analytics or GA4, there are demo accounts that you can get for this stuff as well. So if I jump into my browser, I've got that internet live stats here. Let's go in and let's go GA demo account. What they've now launched, is you can have a Google Analytics property for the Google Merchandise Store, which is basically a real website that they give you the, the data for. Underneath that, which you probably won't just put away, Google Analytics for property Flood It, which is an app. So it's showing you that GA4 is good for apps and for websites. And then below that, Universal Analytics for the Google Merchandise Store as well. If you click through to those, you can get access um, to 
GA4, an example set of data and play around with it. And I would definitely start familiarizing yourself. I think the most well, one of the most important things within GA4, there's a lot more attribution modeling. I'll come on to that, what on earth that's about later on. But really importantly, in the current version of universal analytics, I, everything's at a page level. It's about pages loading. If I want to see how many people scroll to the bottom of the page, or I want to see how many people played the video or played the podcast, um, I need to add some extra code to my web pages. In GA4, it can track these things automatically and you can add new events. You can see here like file downloads, PDFs, we couldn't track that easily before. Um, people scrolling, people playing the video to the end, people progressing through the video to a certain amount, people starting the video, people using internal search, all of this stuff can be tracked automatically. So that's really exciting because it starts to give us a whole more, a whole greater level of detail about where did someone get to filling the form in? How long did they watch the video for? And actually, when you're setting goals in analytics, we, we really had you know, four main types of goals. Uh, a destination, which is thank you for buying. Thank you for filling the form. You got to a certain page. We had a duration. You stayed a certain period of time. A number of pages. You looked at a certain number of pages. And then we had events. And events were great because it was like watching the video to the end, but you needed to add extra code. So if you're an e-commerce website, or a lead generation website, it was pretty easy because the thank you for buying or thank you for filling in the form, we, we knew we'd got what we wanted. Whereas actually, if I was a brand and it was all about, you know, I wanted you to maybe watch a video because I think you're then more likely to do something, well, actually, now I can track that whole lot more easily. So it's going to be really interesting. It's going to give us a lot more um, that we can do with it. So uh, start learning about GA4 if you haven't already and start to look at some of those different reports that are in there because they are, they are great and it's really starting to expand. Google's focusing a lot of effort on it at the moment. Right, last time I spoke about a healthy cynicism of influencer marketing. So what I mean by that is everyone wants to be uh, an influencer. Let's show a little update on that as well. So if I go to Google and I search by Instagram followers and I'll zoom right in and I'll spell that correctly um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch on my keywords everywhere plugin which I would have shown you uh, last time if you're not familiar it's a great little plugin and it gives me data about how many people are searching for things there are now and this has gone up by over 30,000 a month there are now 165,000 people a month trying to buy Instagram followers there you go, buy Instagram followers, 100% real and instant. Now, $2.97, I don't know how many I get for that, $2.97. Um, the point being, what does that say below? Uh, 89 cents per, I don't know if that's 500 or 5,000 because it's blocked off behind what I'm looking at. But the, the point being is that you know, there's a lot of people buying Instagram followers. So we've got a healthy cynicism of this whole thing. Now, a recent study has uh, shown us the, um, in reality, 76% of Instagram influencers, now when they have to do the hashtag ad, when they're going through, um, they then are kind of hiding that. So they're not putting it front and center. They're putting it halfway through the post or they're going through and kind of hiding it in the hashtags at the end and so on as well. That is clearly, it's not necessarily against the law, but it's not really in, in, in the kind of uh, the idea of how things should be done. So there are lots of new guidance rules coming out for influencers. My whole thing with influencers is to say, look, influencer marketing can work really effectively. It doesn't need to be about huge influencers with then tens of millions of followers. It could be micro influence. And that's, that's absolutely fine. But the reality is that you need to be able to calculate your return on investment, just like any, any marketing. And if you can't, then you need to think twice about it. Um, so just really try and put some metric against how we judge these things. And we need to make sure that our influencers are actually looking at this from a kind of ethical viewpoint as well. Right. Something I mentioned last time and I wanted to update on as well. Algorithm changes for Google algorithm. Core Web Vitals. What's that all about? Core Web Vitals was a set of changes to the algorithm that basically were um, trying to help Google understand the usability of a website. So trying to understand how good an experience was it for the user. Now you think, how does an algorithm work out how usable something is? 
Well, in this case, uh, what they're able to do is use these three measures. Just give you an update on these. LCP, largest contentful paint, that's your whole page loading. It's about speed of loading, two and a half seconds. Um, if you want to look at your website, Google Page Speed Insights uh, will give you insights to how fast your page is loading. First input delay, you know when you get to a website and uh, you basically want to click on something, but you have to, you know, it's still loading. Well, they're saying, look, you, you should be able to load things up nice and quickly. And then you should be able to click on it immediately. And it should be more than 100 milliseconds. The last one you only really see on quite dubious websites, cumulative layout shift. You only go to a website, you go to click on something because something shifts and you end up clicking on an ad by accident. That's cumulative layout shift. Google does not like it. This was supposed to come out in May this year. It was delayed until August this year. It then came out and you can find out about your website and, and how it's doing. So let's go through and show you how you can find out about it. So if I go to Google Search Console, which is a Google tool that allows you to kind of see your website from Google's perspective and understand, are there any challenges or problem with your website? I can see the traffic that I'm getting from Google. I can see a whole range of different things, but you can see here now there's a measure that says core web vitals. Now, if I go to this website, I'll show you how quickly it loads. Right, there you go. That loaded very, very quickly as far as I was concerned. If I go through to another page again, load up very quickly. According to core web vitals on mobile, we have 467 poor URLs and on desktop, we have 467 poor URLs. The whole website needs to be sped up. Why is that? This website is basically built on WordPress at the moment. Now, you may not be aware, but with WordPress, you add plugins. It's the most commonly used content management system. And every plugin you load adds a bit of extra code to your website. So very commonly um, an unknown thing. So well, we only use it on these three pages. So it's only going to slow down those three pages. The reality is, in most cases, the plugin loads a bit of code on every single page of your website, even if you're not using it. So you get code bloat and your website gets bigger and bigger. Now, in this particular case, it is perfectly possible to build very, very efficient WordPress websites. I don't want to say that you can't for a second. But the way that ours has been built over a long period of time, adding more plugins, custom plugins and so on, it's kind of got what we call code debt, which means there's all sorts of tangles in the code. So actually to address this, rather than just you know, trying to make it a little bit more efficient, we are rebuilding the entire business from scratch. Now, that sounds pretty serious and it is. There's a long-term reason for that. But this has happened and we were, okay, concerned what it's gonna do for our search rankings. Well, actually, if I look at my coverage um, and let's go performance actually. If I look at my performance and look at you know, how much search traffic am I getting and I look at it over the previous months, it's actually gone up. So let's put this in perspective. Core Web Vitals is part of the algorithm. And it is an important part, but it's not as big a part as we thought. Now, from what I understand, having spoken to a few people at Google, that will ramp up over a period of time because they realize that most people weren't ready for this. So actually, speed of your website is still massively important. You need to look at Core Web Vitals, but actually it's, it's a problem but if you've ticked all the other SEO boxes, it's not the end of the world yet. And I say yet, because it may be in the future. So where are we with the algorithm overall? Quick whiz through these and I'll tell you what's growing. Um, on page optimization, still important, the right words on the page in the right place. That's just helping Google understand what your content's all about. I'll touch on that. Link building, other people linking to you, still important. It's a vote of confidence. Why would someone link to you? Uh, basically because you've got to make useful, entertaining education on your website. It's getting harder and harder to get links of, you know, of a dubious quality. It's really about those organically growing because you've got great content. Social signals, a small part of the algorithm, but how many people are talking and sharing your stuff on social media? Next two, this is the, the next one is the, the biggest growing, user behavior. What's that? Well, if I go through to Google and I do a search, so let's do digital marketing, and let's just do that. Go past the ads. Okay, so if I go into the results down here, if I click on this Neil Patel website, and then I go straight back to Google, you'll notice it says, just down here, people also search for. That's showing you that Google knows that I've gone to a website and gone straight back to Google. That shows a negative 
experience. A positive experience, if I go through and search, if I search for this, so what is data scraping? I can see here that the number one result, if I click on that, that's our website. And when people get here, it's very clear what they're searching for that is here. But then we've got this video at the top of the page. And it's basically an explainer video. It's something that tells people what it's about. Why is it there? Well, some people prefer video content to written content. So some people will watch this. What that will do is it will increase the dwell time on this page. So that's a positive signal to Google. What that means is then when we're creating content, we want to make it broken up with headings and subheadings. We're going to add video on every page. So that increases the dwell time and caters to those people like video. But we won't just stick a video up and hope for the best. What we'll actually do is we will create multiple versions of the video and we'll test them out either as an A-B test, two different versions of the page, see which one gets the best dwell time, or we'll test them in social media first. We'll push them onto our social platforms. We'll see which video gets the most uh, engagement now. What's really interesting is the thumbnail of the video and the video itself has a huge impact. So we did a test uh, with this. Uh, Kieran Rogers is my marketing director. He's worked in marketing for uh, more than two decades, very experienced. He's been e-commerce manager at Fat Face. He's worked um, at Elemis and other massive brands as well. Louise is my marketing manager. She's 21 years old and she came into the role. When Kira did these videos, she's putting them together quickly, getting them out there because he knew what he was doing. Louise was you know, being far more meticulous and careful about what she's doing. So we thought, well, let's test. Let's test Kieran's video versus Louise's video. What Louise got right is she tested different thumbnails. Louise's video, by nature of a slightly different edit and different thumbnails, got 12,000% more engagement than Kieran's, which was slightly embarrassing for Kieran. But actually, um, we did a little bit of a podcast all about it, so you can learn all about it. But we're testing and we're working out what video is better, what layout of the page is better. So A-B testing, you can use Google Optimize. So if I go back to my browser, I go to, uh, let's go back to Google Analytics. What you'll be able to see is over in the top right hand corner of Google Analytics. I've got the little set of squares that tell me what other Google products I've got. And down there, you've got Google Optimize and Google Optimize allows you to set up A-B tests and lots of other types of tests as well to see which version of a web page is better. So that's going to really give us insights into what's working better for our particular audience. So if you're interested in that whole thing, we've got a much more in-depth podcast guide in the slides as well that talks you through the testing process we went through, what works and doesn't work. But as part of the Google algorithm, Core Web Vitals is there. It's probably not as important as we thought it was, but it will gain in importance. And it's important from a user point of view anyway. Whereas that user behavior, staying on a page, longer dwell time is, is increasingly important. So uh, it's definitely worth going having a thinking about that. Uh, conversational design, I touched on this last time and it's really moved on. Conversational design is making chatbots useful. 97% of us at the moment, when you see a chatbot pop and go say, can I help? Think, nope, you probably can't. You're probably really irritated. This is a screenshot from HubSpot. It's the, the CRM system uh, that we use and fundamentally, what this is doing is allow me to kind of create scripts. I want to trigger something, uh, trigger the chatbot. Then I want to give someone some options. Then I want to allow them to trigger that. But what we're doing is based on previous behavior, previous purchase. If you go on and look at three pieces of content about SEO, I could offer you my complete SEO downloadable guide. If you're an existing customer, I could offer you a tour of the new features since you've last been in. If you look like you're looking at pricing, I could send you through to a salesperson if you wanted one. If not, I can give you something to download. I can allow you to book a meeting and those kind of things as well. Lots more we can do with this. The whole first party cookies, customizing things on your website. You can customize content that people see. You can customize their chatbots. You can trigger them emails. You can, in fact, create audiences that you can then upload into Facebook and LinkedIn, other places and target ads at those people. So this whole integration of data making sure that our websites, our customer relationship management systems, our email service providers are all fully integrated 
gives us the ability to get the right content to the right people at the right time. This isn't artificial intelligence. This is just you know, clever scripting. Now, uh, AI and marketing, we're seeing a lot of tools kind of appear uh, with this. Let me just show you this one. So imagine that you're doing some images and you need a photo of someone of a particular gender, a particular age, of a particular ethnicity, in a particular head pose, it might be quite hard to find stock photography. You might have to go and get a model to do that, and it's all a bit of a problem. So instead, you could use this website. And um, this is a load of faces, as you're, you're seeing in just a moment. Um, and what you're going to see is all of these faces here um, are basically not real people. Uh, all of these people have been generated by an AI. And I was doing a training course the other day and someone said, that's my cousin. Um, and I had to kind of reassure them that it, it wasn't their cousin, uh, but uh, these are generated faces. And you can have a play around with this. Um, and let me show you up here as well, uh, the face generator. And bear with me a, a second, because there's something wrong with the power supply for my Mac, which means that it's about to go flat on battery. There we go, I'm back. So I'm going to generate a face. I can go through, right, okay, this person at the moment, um, how about if I want them in a happy pose? Let's update their face. There you go. What about, uh, are they surprised? It's not perfect at the moment. There you go, looking pretty surprised. The point being, this is moving pretty quickly. We can do videos of this very soon as well. So think about what that means from the point of view of when you can generate an animated face doing anything you want. How useful that will be, but what if you can make that face look like someone that you know? The whole deep faking thing starts to become a, a huge thing. Now, just while we're on this, and to, to start bringing this into reality where this is really useful, um, you're gonna start seeing a lot of this, which is I'm in Google Ads, and uh, basically it's saying here, when you set your targeting options, because of this whole third-party cookies thing, it's saying, just do automated targeting. And it says, generally, automated targeting can improve campaign performance uh, by up to 20%. This is Google using artificial intelligence to target my ads. So they're using a whole load of data to try and find people. They look at what's on my website. They work out people's interest. They try and match the two things up. You need to test this. My advice at the moment is to do a couple of things. First of all, build a campaign and run it without automated targeting. Set your targeting criteria to the best of your ability, run that campaign on a limited budget. Then do the same thing, but set it to automated targeting, again, on the same limited budget. Then what you'll get is two sets of data that show you your budget, you'll see your average cost per click, you'll see your average click-through rate, and then you'll then be able to go into analytics and you'll be able to go through and look at what return on investment you got from that investment, that particular uh, money that you spend on the budget. And you'll be able to see, did you get better reach? Did you get better engagement? Did it drive the outcomes that you actually wanted it to do? This AI is getting better uh, all the time, but we need to go through and uh, to make sure that we've tested this out because we can't just assume that these ad platforms are doing the best thing for us. We need to, we need to kind of test it out. So, I said there was a skills crisis and we're about to publish with the Chartered Institute of Marketing the latest version of the digital marketing skills benchmark. Um, if you want to benchmark yourself instantly, if you just Google digital marketing skills benchmark, you will find it. If you want to benchmark your team, you can go in and do that as well. But fundamentally, what we've seen is what is the most in-demand skill? So I wanted to share that because we're all kind of learning all the time with, with digital marketing. The most in-demand skill is analytics analysis. That's looking at analytics and working out what it's telling you. And I'll just finish with a, a bit of a story in, in relation to that. We were working with a high street bank, a retail bank, and they said to us, look, we want to learn more about content marketing. So we gave them a big training session and a workshop about content marketing. And they said, brilliant, we have in, we've embraced content marketing. And now people are staying on our website three times longer. And that sounded really good. But we said, we better look at the data. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So what we actually saw is before they redesigned their website with all this great content, what was happening is people going through to the website, they were waiting five seconds for the page to load, and then they were going through and clicking log into personal banking. That was it, that was your average visitor. When they redesigned the website, they moved that login button. Then what happened? People came in, they waited five seconds for the page to load. They then spent 10 seconds saying, where's the button gone? And eventually they clicked on it down here. The visit had gone from five seconds to 15 seconds. Your analytics reported a 300% visit duration. And you said, brilliant, people are staying three times longer. And in reality, you've just annoyed your customers for 10 seconds. So we have to be able to paint a picture with the data. And we have to go through and say, what is this actually telling us? We then need to change something. And then we need to look at the data again. And that iteration is absolutely what's at the heart of digital marketing, changing it from being an art into a science. And the skill to do that, to interrogate the data, is the place where the skill gap is and is the place where a lot of the opportunity is as well for all marketing roles, but also for specialists uh, that are interested in, in those kind of things as well. So lots of opportunity. Also, what you'll see is this, this isn't the, the latest data. There is still a big skills gap though, and you'll see the report in the next couple of weeks um, when it comes out as well. So what should we do with all this change and all this noise and all these skills gaps as well? We just need to step back to the fundamentals of marketing. And that's basically, to focus on our user and their journey. What are they, do they actively want what I've got at the moment or are they just browsing in social media? Yeah, if they're using TikTok, do they really want my business to business service? When I send them email, should I be trying to sell them stuff? Once I understand who my audience is, what they want, where they want it and when they want it, that's it, that's the fundamentals of marketing. And if you get that right, that's what works. Doesn't have to be anything particularly clever like our podcast or that email. The, the, the creation of those is nothing complicated at all. It just is the right content at the right time. We understand our persona is a marketer or a student who wants to stay up to date. Therefore, that in a podcast format is useful. Sending them a couple of tools at the right time is useful. So if we think from that perspective, and I bring you back to what I said before, think about what you can do for your audience, not what you can do to your audience. So all of the websites that I have mentioned uh, are in the Digital Marketing Toolkit. If you Google the Digital Marketing Toolkit, we updated this about 10 days ago. So uh, if you Google Digital Marketing Toolkit, you will see the very latest version of that. It is a PDF that has got about 50 of the best tools, free tools that are out there. Um, it's not supposed to be a definitive list. It is a curated list uh, and it is there to help you out. So Google Digital Marketing Toolkit and uh, feel free to download that completely free, no email registration or anything like that uh, required. Um, that's all my slides. If you want to get in contact, it's Daniel Rolls on Twitter, Target Internet on Instagram. If you're on LinkedIn and you'd like to connect up, it is just Daniel Rolls, and I will be really happy to connect. Just mentioned that you had a listen to this webinar, um, so I know where you've come from. If you want the podcast, the podcast is ad-free, targetinternet.com forward slash podcast, and you will see all of the episodes. There's about 280 odd episodes in there now, so plenty to keep you going uh, for a very, very long time. That is everything for me. Uh, I'm going to pass back to Phil in just a moment uh, in terms of uh, any questions and things that you've got um, as well. So thank you for listening to that. And you can continue to en enter your questions into the question. So Phil, have we got any questions come in so far? Uh, we have, yes, uh, Daniel. Um, thanks very much for that. That's a really good presentation. But before I uh, get to the questions, I just want to remind people that there's still time to download Daniel's presentation slides on the handout section and just a little reminder that if you're enjoying the webinar and you want to post on social media you can use the hashtag CIM events okay so um, one of our uh, attendees asked about the um, free tools that you mentioned I guess mm. every, every tool that you mentioned this evening they'll find on your digital marketing toolkit is that correct yeah they will so that, let me just show you that actually I could uh, explain how it's kind of broken down as well so if I just google Digital marketing toolkit, and this is the moment of truth because one day it won't be at number one in Google, and I'll embarrass myself. Right there, you go. So, digital marketing toolkit um, updated in September. It's broken down by section. So, for example, the first one is data insights and blogs. If you want to see what percentage of people are using TikTok, are listening to podcasts, there'll be data in there. If you want the keyword research tools, they'll be under search. If you want the social media tools, they're all in there. 
So it's broken down by category. We update it regularly, but you, you'll find everything there. And everything I've mentioned today uh, is in there, with the exception of those AI faces. If you want that, if you just search generated faces, you'll find that website. Um, and it's quite good fun to play around with, have a look at generated faces as well. Okay, great. Thanks very much for that, Daniel. Um, okay, going right back to the uh, start of your presentation, you talked about uh, the importance of email. Um, so the question here is, how do you manage the right to be forgotten or unsubscribe when sending email to a personal email address? So um, very clearly, opt-in process in the first place is really important. So you need to make sure that it's very clear what people are getting and that they are opting in. So all the GDPRs uh, are all about that as well. That data then needs to be stored in a centralized system and you need a process for people to get in contact with you to say, I want all of my data to, to be deleted. So in an ideal world, you have a preference center that someone can go into at the bottom of your email. They can always have the unsubscribe button, but if you've got a preference center, they can go in and say what they do and don't want and actually they can request to be deleted. If not, in your privacy policy, um, as part of GDPR, you need the contact for someone to say, I want you to get rid of my details um, as well. If they don't have that, you should use the contact at email address for that business and they should uh, therefore go through and delete all your details should they ask them to. So for example, in our CRM system, we've got a track of all the communications we've had with someone, what they've done on our website and so on. If someone wants to delete that, they can. The option we always do is give them is we can say, we can delete that and keep your email, but mark you as a do not contact. The logic of that is otherwise, if they come back to our website and fill in a form again and log in, it's gonna start collecting their data again. So we're gonna give them that flexibility, but you need to put those measures in place um, and as part of your GDPR. Um, and in the UK, it still counts as a regulation. It's now GDPR UK, um, and you need to go through and, and make sure you kind of have those processes in place and that's all laid out um, in your privacy policies and so on on your website. Great. Um, okay, um, a question around e-commerce. So to build an e-commerce website for a growing brand, is WordPress a better platform or something like Shopify in the long run? So in the short term, Shopify is brilliant because you'll get out there quickly. It's got amazing functionality. The problem is you are limited by what they offer. And although that is a lot, don't get me wrong. And there are plenty of really, really big businesses out there. A lot of the products that you see on Instagram that get big, like um, there's lots of things like, uh, health products like Goli that do kind of vitamin jellies and things like that, they, they ran on Shopify websites. However, WordPress gives you a lot more flexibility. Now bear in mind, you can start on wordpress.com. That will give you some basic functionality. Then you can move to the expanded hosting they have. And eventually if you want to, you can move to your own hosting. And you have absolute control over customization, all those kind of things. The thing is, make sure you get the hosting right. It's probably one of the most important things you need. Someone that's going to deal with security for you, someone that's going to update things, that's got really responsive um, customer support. Um, the one that I would recommend is listed in the toolkit. So if you go to the toolkit, um, under the stuff in there, we, we use a company called Kinsta. Go and have a look in the toolkit. And there's some. that's the one we use. So we kind of recommend them. Um, but if you get that right, WordPress gives you a lot of flexibility going forwards. Just make sure you don't get plug-in bloat which is just adding thousands of plugins. The answer to everything is not a plugin. So just, just make sure you think about that because otherwise you're going to slow your website down, but you can still do a huge amount with WordPress and I'm a big fan still. Oh, great, okay. Um, I'm going to come back to some technical questions in just a tick, but obviously we've got um, quite a number of students who are actually on the uh, webinar this evening. So they've got some questions around how to, you know, how to succeed in, the, in this particular mm. sector. So if I can just um, probably read out one or two um, and then you get a feel for the sort of things I want to know. So um, what's the best advice for students who are looking to enter the sector is one. Um, are analytics and contact marketing skills in demand all over marketing or specifically digital marketing roles? And do you have any tips for someone coming out of university not knowing what part of marketing they want to go into? So three questions yeah. there. Yeah, 100%. I think they're all very closely connected. Right. I, I would say we need to stop separating marketing and digital marketing. I mean, realistically, though, roles are advertised as digital marketing roles, marketing roles. Basically, the digital marketing roles are more in demand and are higher paid. You know, a marketing director role, don't get me wrong, but a marketing director should know everything about marketing and digital marketing. 
So I, I, I honestly think that digital marketing is a good way to go. I guess I would, um, since I spent all my time educating people and that was my career. Um, analytics, content marketing, very much in demand as, as, the, as all brands are using digital marketing now. Um, the big brands that are very big on TV and brand will still be doing all this digital stuff as well. My advice is something I kind of learned the hard way, which was that a really good way of starting your career in digital marketing is to go into a small or medium digital marketing agency. Why I say an agency is that you will work on lots of different projects and you will get your hands on lots of different things. The reason to say a small agency is that you won't just be stuck doing one thing. You'll have to be a real kind of uh, problem solver and you'll have to work on lots of the things and you'll get some client facing skills and you maybe get some technical skills and you can work out what it is that you're kind of good at. I think the type of marketers that are in demand are what we'd refer to as the T-shaped people, which has been talked about in skills a lot, which is they have a broad set of skills, but they have a deep level of knowledge in one area, whether that is you know, analytics or paid search or SEO or anything really matter or design or anything. So be a problem solver, get a broad range of skills, but but deep dive into particular when you work out what it is that you want to deep dive into. I don't think there's anything we're saying. I don't know what I don't want to deep dive into yet. I also think people say, well, if I get into the agency world, I won't be able to go client side. Totally disagree with that. If you've been on the agency side, moving client side is is not too bad at all. Going the other way is harder. Because people go, well, you won't really get the cut and thrust of it. And, you, you know, the pace of change and all those kind of things as well. Both had their advantages. Both had their challenges. I know plenty of people that have done both. But I think starting a small agency gives you and a growing agency will give you lots of opportunity because you'll get to try out lots of things. You'll get to learn what you like and what you don't like. And you will have to get your hands dirty with all those different things as well. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. And there are loads of roles um, kind of going in those kind of positions at the moment as well. But as a student to differentiate yourself, you know, if everyone's got a degree in marketing or whatever it may be, you need to show some practical stuff. Here's a WordPress website that I build and optimized and I blogged on and I created a podcast and I drove traffic to it and I ran some test campaigns in paid social. It doesn't need to be spending any more than 20 pounds. And I, I, you know, demonstrate you've done it hands on. Show the analytics, show what you can kind of drive from that. The digital marketing podcast costs us nothing to produce. Um, it's you know we started off with really low quality mics. We did it in cafes. You're here in the background. I used to live in Brighton for a very long time, and um, you can hear seagulls in the background, all sorts of things. And maybe added some personality. Now we're now we've got a studio, but the point being is produce something, create something, and demonstrate it. Find a brand or something that you can work on for free. Get some kind of hands on skills because if you do that, then you can differentiate yourself. And I've learned this. Um, I've gone through and I've applied it in this way. Go off and do your Google Analytics qualification. So you can do a, a Google Analytics qualification. Think about doing those kind of things as well. You've got Google Garage that gets you to do the basic stuff and so on. So do those online certifications if you can do them as well. But I think start in an agency if you can or and, and kind of build things up because that will give you a broad set of skills. That's great. Uh, thanks very much for that, Daniel. Some really sad advice there. So. Um, it's got loads of questions. I'm not going to be able to get through them all, but I'll do my best. So we're going to get a bit more te technical now. Um, how long does it take with new websites for the Google Search Console to work and show the core web vitals as having a new web as having a new website is still not showing anything, and the website has been up for around two months now? Is there a minimum time? It should be 30 days, but if you're not getting it, let me just go in um, for you. So if I go to Search Console. If I go into core web vitals, um, what you should get, and I'll show you two ways of doing this. It should be when you go through that uh, you can go through here and if the report is empty, you should still be able to drill into it. And then you should be able to, and you may not, but you should. Let's give this a second to open up. Let's try this again, because it's just gone back in a circle. There you go, it's opening up now. Um, when I go into that, what I should be able to do is uh, there go for an ask the validation. And I should go validate fixes if you're not showing up. So that's one that you may be able to do. If you can't, the big problem is that there aren't enough links through to the website. So you want to gain more links through to the website. So um, down here where I can see links, I can see the number of external links to the website. 
if uh, that is starting to show up a, a number in there, it doesn't need to be hundreds. It you know, just, just could be in the, in the kind of dozens. Um, the other thing that I want to then forego through and do is make sure that they are actually coming back to my website. And if I go to URL inspect and I put the URL in here, um, it will then give me the option of resubmitting that as well. So it may be you need to kind of resubmit, but there's a number of steps you could kind of do that as well. If you get really stuck, you've got my social media contact details, um, feel free to reach out and I can I can send you some pointers towards that as well. Um, still on the subject of analytics, then what is the best place to go if you want to upskill on the new GA4 Google Analytics? Right, there's an absolute kind of a lack of good tutorials on this at the moment. So the best way of doing it is to go through and get that Google Analytics demo account. And there's a load of data in there that you can start playing around with um, and you can start understanding. Google are starting to release, if I just show you as well in here, I'll go into Google Analytics and I'm gonna go from our universal analytics. You can see it says UA75, whatever it is, our code there. If I go to this version, uh, this is the GA4 uh, version as well. When you're in here, as you're going through any particular report, so if I go through to user acquisition uh, or something along those lines as well, um, what you're seeing here is there's a little few things along the tab here where you can kind of get some insights, you can customize the reports, you can do segments, all those sorts of different things as well. Have a play around with all those settings and see what they do. One, they're changing all the time um, as well. There are some tutorials in here but it's uh, a little bit lacking in the GA4 um, side of things as well. So the, the best way is kind of playing around with it at the moment. The other place that I would look is uh, Search Engine Journal um, are doing a pretty good job of this and Moz are doing some good tutorials at the moment. They're quite SEO focused, but they're, they're not bad places to go as well. So uh, to take a look at those. Okay, um, I say we've got loads of questions. I can't get them through more. We've got probably got a couple of minutes uh, left, Daniel. So um, this question is, do you think all brands should be on new platforms like TikTok? And I guess a supplementary question is, are there any new social media platforms that we should be looking out for? My feeling on this is, first of all, should we all be on TikTok? Absolutely not. Um, lots of brands are trying to go onto TikTok at the moment that really aren't very well suited to it. They don't get it. And there is nothing more cringeworthy than seeing a brand trying to be down with the kids on TikTok. It just doesn't really work. So. If it's right, if that's where your audience is, then, you know, if, if I was marketing at a, a university and I was targeting, you know, 16 to 18 year olds, then maybe that is a place I'd go. If I'm doing B2B service, it's just not relevant. It's just not where my audience is. If I ask my audience to use TikTok, one in about 20 of them does, and they're not going there for that kind of stuff. So, no, you're better off doing one channel well than six channels badly. I think it's really, really important. In terms of the upcoming channels, um, things that are kind of shifting, what I would actually say is rather than focusing on that at the moment, we should be looking at how the channels we're using are changing. So if you look at how Instagram is changing, the focus on video and reels, how those reels are now showing up in Facebook, um, messenger advertising, WhatsApp advertising, that kind of stuff. And actually, maybe stepping back and going, channels isn't really the issue, it's our content. Let's just do something that's exceptional. And rather than doing four bits of content, do one but do it better, I think that, has, that moves the needle a little bit more. There is definitely an advantage to being like first lead on a platform. If you, you know, those YouTubers that got in early, those podcasters that got in early, they got the audience while it was building as a lot of the TikTokers have. But that's not necessarily as a business what we want. As an influencer, it might be. But again, influence can be taken away from you by these platforms. They can, they can stop monetization, they can do different things. So I would just go actually focus on the content, not the platform. Video is pretty universal. So we could see how that works across different platforms. That's great. Okay. Um, I think we've run out of time, actually, uh, Daniel. So um, thanks very much. Again, some brilliant questions and some brilliant answers. Um, and also, um, um, sadly, that's all the time we have for our webinar. So um, again, thanks, Daniel, for your presentation. We do hope you found it uh, interesting and worthwhile. We'll be back with a special Lunchtime Marketing Club webinar on uh, the subject of boosting your employability on the 20th October. Uh, when we'll be discussing the skills and competencies needed to help you progress to the next stage in your career. Obviously, Daniel covered digital skills in his presentation this evening. So that's on the 20th of October. And on the evening of the 17th of November, 
we will hear about binge marketing. So this is all about how to apply the techniques and tactics that creators of films and series use to tell your brand story and build your audience. You can find further details listed on the events page on the CIAM website, where you'll be able to register for these sessions. So on behalf of CIAM, thank you once again, Daniel, for a really good presentation. And a thank you too for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.